book of Revelation this morning. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 is where we will start. And we will, Lord willing, make it through verse 21 this morning. Revelation 3, 14. Revelation is a tough book of the Bible. It's the last book of the Bible. It's easy to find if you're not familiar with it. Just turn to the back and you'll get there. It's difficult because of the language and the symbolism that we see in the book of Revelation. And this is the same type of symbolism and language we see in other prophetic books as well. But it's difficult because it's hard for us to know always what the symbolism means. I mean, uh, sometimes we can tell what the symbolism means. For instance, when it talks about the lamb that was slaughtered. Well, that one's pretty easy for us. We know that that's referencing Jesus. We believe, and or at least I believe, that that's symbolic language. I don't think when we are before the throne of God that, that there will be a, a slain lamb there. But when we see that language in Revelation, we are speaking of Jesus Christ. And, and we see lots of language that's kind of, kind of crazy to us about dragons and all kind of stuff in the book of Revelation that is difficult for us to discuss. Now, we are not going to break that down. We did that a few years ago, went through the whole book. Uh, there's obviously lots of different views and interpretations on those things. But at the very beginning of the book of Revelation, it's not quite as difficult. Um, it's a little more straightforward. Now, there is certainly symbolic language that is used from the very first chapter all the way through chapter 3. But it's a little, little bit of an easier read because Jesus is sending letters here to seven churches. Now, you may can argue that there is some symbolism attached to these seven churches, but the fact of the matter is, is that there were quite literally these seven churches that were around in these different areas that these letters were going out to. And some of these churches were doing pretty good. Uh, some of them were doing pretty bad. Some of them were kind of in between. And Jesus is speaking to these churches and giving each of them instruction. Now, we cannot deny the fact that these were literal churches with literal you know, bodies of Christ, of Christians there, that these letters were going to. Uh, some have suggested, and particularly in the historist view of Revelation, that each of these seven churches represent a period of time throughout church history and that they, they, they coincide with events that occur over, over a span of time and that... Uh, many would argue that right now we're in the time of the Laodiceans, the, the last church age, and the things that we see in the church of Laodicea are part of our modern culture and world today for the last couple of hundred years or so. However, when we read through these seven churches, the things that we see that they do both good and bad are things that are applicable to anybody of Christ throughout all of church history. And so I don't necessarily hold to the fact that they are representative of a particular time. They are representative of all times. Because if you read through all of these seven churches, you'll find some churches in our world today that are doing well, that Jesus would say you're doing well. You'd find other churches in our world today that Jesus would say you're not doing so well. And so if you've never read through these first three chapters of Revelation, I would encourage you to do so and read these seven churches. And not think about it uh, necessarily just as collectively as a body of Christ, but look at your life individually and see if you are guilty of some of the things that Jesus calls out. Maybe, maybe you can be encouraged by some of the things that Jesus says you're doing good in these areas. I mean, there are times that we do good as Christians and times that we do not do good. Uh, and so these seven churches, when we read them, are good for us. Now, we are not going to look at all seven. We're just going to look at the church of Laodicea this morning and we're going to see what was going on with them and maybe what from that we can take and apply to our lives so let's pray and then we'll jump in Father God we come to you we thank you for your good word and God I pray that you help us to understand what it says God we scratch our head sometimes with revelation we don't maybe understand all the symbolism of how things occurred or when they will occur have they occurred will they occur dear Lord these things are debated among Christians but dear Lord we know that Right at the central focus of all of this is Jesus Christ. And God is Jesus that gives us these words that we will read today. God, let us look at our own life to see if they apply to us. God, maybe you are knocking on our doors this morning to get our attention, 
to see if we'll answer your call and live by your word. So God, I pray that you would just hide me behind the cross, that you would just help me to preach and teach in a way that brings glory to you. Take away my pride, my fear, and God, let when my mouth opens, let your Holy Spirit speak to all of our hearts, that we would hear from you and that we would listen to you today. God, I pray that if there's one in this room that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that God, today, your Holy Spirit would convict them, even right now. God, that they would hear you knocking on their door, the door of their soul, dear Lord, desiring God for Jesus to come in and be their Lord. God, I pray that if there are any that do not know Jesus today, that before they leave, that they would have put their faith in him. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 14. Write to the angel of the church in Laodicea. Now, when it says angel here, it could be speaking of a heavenly being like we may think of, a winged creature. It's possible that this is the, main, uh, the, the angel that's speak, spoken of here. But when we look at the word angel in the Greek that we translate as angel sometimes, uh, it also simply means messenger. Now, that messenger could be a human messenger. It's possible that this message was going through some human messenger or preacher or evangelist of some sort. Uh, it's also possible that God could be acting in a kind of a supernatural way with a, with a, with a heavenly being in, in the form of an angel. Uh, some of your translations, probably most of them actually, will say angel there, but it could be speaking of a human messenger or an angelic messenger, either one. It doesn't really matter who's bringing the message. What matters is the message. And the message is going to the church of Laodicea. Now, Laodicea was a town that was not too far from Colossae. We know that from the book of Colossians. Uh, and if we continue reading on, uh, we see here that the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation, says... Now, these titles that are given here are titles that apply to Jesus. In each of these, these churches, these letters, it's Jesus who's doing the speaking. And he's got uh, different titles attributed to him uh, in the introduction of these letters to these churches. And here in the church of Laodicea, he is referred to as the Amen, the Faithful, and True Witness. Now, the Amen, that's an interesting title for Jesus that we hear. Uh, the word amen means uh, so be it, or it is true, or, or it has been fulfilled. That's kind of what, what we see when we say amen. Sometimes we see that in our, in our text. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you. We see Jesus say that. If you, have a, if you have a King James translation, it may say verily, verily. Well, that's uh, literally amen, amen uh, is what's being said there. Uh, and so we see that phrase sometimes and it's a it's a it's a phrase of of affirmation or something that has come to be something that a promise that has been fulfilled something that is true something that can you can hang your hat on you can know that it's true well that's jesus jesus is the amen uh we see in second corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 it says for every one of god's promises is yes in him therefore the amen is also spoken through him by us for God's glory. Now the hymn that's being spoken of there is Jesus. And what does it say of God's promises? That God's promises are yes in Jesus. That is to say, everything that God has promised has been fulfilled in Jesus. There's nothing that God said it was going to be that, that has not occurred. It has been yes. God said it, yes, it has occurred. It has been fulfilled. Through Jesus, he is the yes. And the same language in 2 Corinthians 1.20. Therefore, the amen, that is Jesus, is also spoken through him by us for God's glory. That is the amen, the so be it, the it is true, it is. It is. Same type of language in reference to Jesus in Paul's writings in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so we see this title of Jesus here. He is he is the, 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 the symbol of completion, that all has been fulfilled. He is the one speaking, that all is true. He is the true witness, that what God has promised has come to be. And so this is who's speaking. Another title uh, uh, applied to Jesus here, the originator of God's creation says. Now, some of your translations may say something like the beginning of God's creation. 
Uh, the word that's used there can be translated as beginning or origin, either one. Uh, for some, this verse may be a, a little bit of a stumbling block, and I, I think that sometimes verses like these are translated, in my opinion, uh, wrong, because some would say that Jesus has a beginning, that he was created. Some would say that Jesus was created by God, and that passages like these show that Jesus has a beginning. Uh, but I do not believe that to be the case. I do not believe that Jesus has been created. Jesus has always been for all of eternity. In the beginning was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. John chapter 1. Read that. You can see all that there. And so uh, even though Jesus was in the beginning, he has always been because he is God. And so uh, some translations may use the word originator to kind of, to kind of take the edge off of that to, to, to not give the wrong message. And that's, that's not a bad translation for that. And so Jesus was the originator of everything in the beginning. Not that he was created first in the beginning, but that in the beginning everything was created through him, by him, and for him. We see this language in um, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. And so it is through Jesus that everything is created. So uh, Jesus has always been, but in the beginning, by Jesus, for Jesus, through Jesus, all things were created. This is the one who is speaking here. So the church should know, based on this type of language and these titles of what's being said and what we've seen earlier in the book, we can certainly uh, deduce from this that it is Jesus who is the one doing the speaking. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that Laodicea was not far from Colossae, uh, where we see the book of Colossians that Paul wrote that book to. We see a brief mention of Laodicea uh, in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, When this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. So Paul says, exchange these letters that, that are, that are going to go from place to place. Now, the fact that Colossae is supposed to send their letter to Laodicea and that they're, they are close in relation to where they are on the map may place some significance in this passage as it goes on, at least giving us some clues about some of the language that Jesus is using. Let's continue on in verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Wow. Now that's, that's pretty stern language that Jesus says to this church. He says, I know your works. Now some of the churches, he knew their works and they were good. But that was not the case for the people of Laodicea. He says, I know your works. And what does he say? You're not hot and you're not cold. You are lukewarm. He says, I wish you would be one or the other. Now, what, what does Jesus mean when he says this? Well, there's a couple of ways that we make it interpret uh, what Jesus says. Uh, one popular uh, thought among, among Christians and scholars is based on where Laodicea got their water supply from. Now, they had towns surrounding them, like Colossae and some other places, uh, and, 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 and they got their water from, from different sources. Uh, and, and one of the towns nearby uh, Laodicea, they were known for their hot springs. They had very hot water. Another town near Laodicea had very cold water. Now, you know with water that both cold and hot have their uses, right? I mean, when you take a bath, you don't want to take a bath in really cold water. Probably, I, I would suspect you don't. We like our water to be kind of hot. But there are also times that it's good to have, have some cold water. I mean, cold water is good too. You've been working on a, on a hot day outside. What do you want? You want some ice cold water. So both hot water and cold water have their usefulness. Now, one possible uh, way that we could take what Jesus is saying here is that, is that the church of Laodicea is not useful. Their neighbors have hot water and cold water, so they would have known the importance of having both. 
But perhaps by the time it got back to Laodicea from either side that it came from, it was lukewarm. And so they didn't get either of the benefits. Uh, it was water that, in, in essence, you could say was useless. Uh, it was not good for anything. Now, that may be one way to interpret this, and that may be what Jesus means in some sense. Uh, another way that we could interpret this, however, uh, is that Jesus is saying, I want you to be hot on fire for me. I'd rather you be cold, like not even know me, than, than, than say that you're mine, but yet not be excited about me at all. Now, to me, that seems like a more natural reading of the text that Jesus says, I wish you'd be one way or another. I mean, for God's people, we should be on fire for God. We should be about the Lord's work and excited about the Lord. But, but if we're not going to be excited about the Lord, perhaps it'd be better if we didn't even know the Lord. At least then we'd have an excuse. I mean, at least then we'd be unbelievers and sinners and not knowing the power of God. But for us to know the power of God who have put our faith in Jesus Christ and still just to be kind of lukewarm... <coughs> Perhaps that's what Jesus means there. Whatever interpretation that we would uh, take from this, whether it be these two suggested or some other interpretation, the point is, is that the people of Laodicea, the Christians there, the church there, are not doing good by Jesus. And Jesus says, whatever you're doing, it's not good. And I'm not happy with you, and I'm going to vomit you out. Right? We get that. I mean... There are some things that we want to drink that we want them to be really hot, and there are some things that we want to drink that we want them to be really cold. You certainly don't want to get something that's lukewarm. Here's a good example of that, coffee. Some people like their coffee piping hot. They get it off the, off the, off the uh, griddle, and then they go put it in the microwave for two minutes, and then they can't even sip it. They're like, because it's so hot, because they like it really hot, and coffee's good when it's really hot. But other people, they like cold coffee. Ain't that the craziest thing here? They like their coffee so cold with ice in it. But what you won't find, at least I don't know of anybody, that likes their coffee lukewarm. Nobody takes their cold coffee and sits it on the table for a couple of hours. Nobody takes their hot coffee and sits it on the table for a couple of hours and comes back and says, this is just right. No, we want it to be hot or we want it to be cold. And so Jesus said, you're not even worth drinking. If you was water, you wouldn't even be worth drinking. You're not good no matter which way you are. You're lukewarm. And he says, I'm going to spit you out. Now, that's, that's serious language. He's speaking to Christians here. At least those who profess to be Christians. He's speaking to a church, a church body, and Laodicea. And so we need to pay attention to these words. We don't like to think that we are those who are lukewarm or that we are those who may be useless in the kingdom of God. But perhaps we are. So maybe we need to check our own life out. He continues on in verse 17. Because you say, I'm rich, I have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't know that you are rich, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, I advise you to buy from me. Now, before we see what Jesus goes on to tell them to do here, we see their condition. What is their condition? They say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and need nothing. So they were a pretty proud people. Now, it is said of Laodicea, based on history, that it was a very wealthy place. There were a lot of wealthy people in Laodicea. They were known for their wealth, their financial institutions, their textile industry, and for their school of medicine that was there. Now, these are all things that we can see when we research and learn about Laodicea. And these things, I think, are, are important for us to consider because of the language that we are going to see Jesus use. So what have these people begun to trust in? They have begun to trust in their wealth. In their mind, they say, I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I need nothing. Now, they were saying this from a sense of pride. Now, sometimes we may say, you know what, I've got everything I need. Well, sometimes we say that out of a, out of a heart of contentment, and that's good when we say, you know, I've got everything I need. But, but we realize we're not saying that we don't need anything whatsoever. I mean, we realize that even if we've got food today, that we're going to have to eat food tomorrow. So... We can say with some, with some heart of contentment, you know, I've got all I need. And sometimes we say that in saying, I don't need a big fancy house or a fancy car. I've got all I need. God has provided my clothes or my food or my water or whatever. And that's good. That's good when we have that level of contentment in our life. But that's not what the people of Laodicea were saying here. They were saying, I have become rich. I have become wealthy. And I don't need anything. I can take care of myself. It's all about me and what I can do. Now, that's a bad place to be, especially for a believer, because when our heart begins to trust in our wealth and our talents and our abilities, then guess what? 
We don't have much need for God when we can do everything for ourselves. So we want to watch out for that, brother and sister in Christ. You want to watch out for that, that we don't get to that point. We must be completely dependent on God. Even if God blesses us and we do well in life and we have some stuff, well, praise the Lord, but we got it from the Lord. I mean, God is the one that blesses us. We are completely dependent on God. And there are many people who have not yet put their faith in Jesus Christ who are like the people of Laodicea. They say, I don't need God. I'm doing good. I can take care of myself. I'll make my own way. I'll get to the top. I'll get money. I'll provide for myself. I'll have the fancy things. I don't need anybody, not even God. Now, there are a lot of people that say that in this world, and maybe some of you in this room. Whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, I will tell you today that you need God. Because whatever you have, you may have worked hard, praise the Lord, God wants us to. But God has granted us what we have because He has given it to us, regardless of how hard we work. So we have not, we have not earned our own way, so to speak, apart from God. It is God who has been with us and provides for us what we had. The people of Laodicea obviously had not recognized that. And Jesus, he puts them in their place and he says, look, you don't know what you really are. You think you're all that in a bag of chips. But he says, what you really are is wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Now that's, that's language that people don't like to hear, right? You know, we talk about that sometimes. Us sinners, we don't like when people tell us that we're sinners. And sometimes we have to be told that, maybe through a brother or sister in Christ or maybe through the Word of God. But Jesus doesn't hold anything back here. He says, you think you're all right. You think you're all that? But let me tell you what you really are. Wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They were naked and obviously didn't know that they were naked. As Adam and Eve in the beginning, they were naked and felt no shame, but then when sin came, they did feel shame. But that's not the case for these people. They're living in sin, and they obviously feel no shame. And Jesus says, you're not in a good spot. You're pretty pitiful right now. And maybe if we're honest, maybe those words would apply to us. Maybe we are not doing as good as we thought we were doing, think we are doing. Maybe we need to pray that God would help our eyes to be opened, help us to see our sins so that we don't fall into the same trap as the Laodiceans. Verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich, white clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not be exposed, an ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. Now, these things that Jesus says here in verse 18 are good things that we can kind of kind of wrap our head around what he's meaning. But, but if indeed Laodicea was a, a, a place known for financial institutions and a place known for their textiles, for their clothing, and a place known for their medicine, and particularly eye medicine, uh, then these things that Jesus said may be, may be said very specifically for a reason. They may not just be, just be general things that Jesus is saying. He may be using these examples because these are things that would hit very close to home for the people of Laodicea. Now, when Jesus speaks in this way, he's not just telling them they need, they need gold that's pure and better clothes to wear, and they need, they need, they need better medicine for their eyes. He's not speaking in the, in the physical sense here. He's speaking in the spiritual sense, that they, need to be, that they need to be refined spiritually, that their life needs to be uh, transformed. And he says, I advise you to buy uh, from me gold refined in the fire. Now, we see that type of language that God speaks of his people about this refining that God's people are refined, that, the, that, the, that the, the dirty nastiness comes to the top and it can, be, it can be scraped off as when gold is refined. And that's what God does to those who are His. You know, He tests us sometimes. He puts us through the fires. And hopefully we see that sin in our life that shouldn't be there and we repent and God can kind of clean our life up through the blood of Jesus Christ and we can continue to seek God and grow in Him and so He can help kind of purge those impurities out of us so that we uh, can draw closer to Him. That's what Jesus is saying here, and that's the language that we see uh, throughout the Bible. In uh, the Old Testament, we see in Daniel chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, speaking of things to come at an uh, end time. Now, we won't break down this chapter and when that end time may be, but listen to what Daniel said in Daniel 12, 9 and 10. He said, Go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, 
but the wise will understand. Now, we see those who are wicked and those who appear to be faithful to God, and those who are gods are going to be uh, uh, cleansed and refined here. That same type of language that Jesus is using uh, in Revelation 3. Another example of that uh, is found in uh, 1 Peter. In 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verses 6 and 7, it says, uh, You rejoice in this, though now for a short time you have had to struggle in various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold, which perishes, though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so... Uh, what is Jesus saying here? That, that our, our repentance and our soul and our ability to put our faith in him is, is more precious than anything, uh, even than gold that's refined by fire. But even as Christians, sometimes we go through a refining process where God allows us to go through things that kind of tests us to bring those impurities to the top. And that's what Jesus says the church of Laodicea needs. They need to be refined uh, to buy gold from him. That is, their life really needs to be transformed in the right way. And he goes on to say, uh, so that they may be rich, uh, that they need to buy from him white clothes, so that they may be dressed and their shameful nakedness not exposed. We see sometimes a reference of dirty clothes, which is a, a, a reference to sin that our clothes are dirty uh, when we are sinner. That's sometimes the terms that's used in Scripture. And what does Jesus do? He cleanses us. He makes us white as snow. And so here's this idea of being clothed with white clothes, clothed with the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Take off your dirty garments, your sinful garments. Be a new person. Take off the old, put on the new. That's what Jesus says. Don't, don't keep doing things the way you are, but be refined. Be a new person and, and, and put on Jesus Christ. And he, he goes on to say, and, and spread ointment on your eyes so that you may see. Obviously, they thought they saw, but they didn't see. That was the problem with a lot of the religious folks of Jesus' day. Those, those people who were very religious and, man, they thought they knew everything. They thought they knew God's word, and they did, but they, they missed the heart of it. They didn't really follow God. They knew the letter of the law, but they didn't follow God. And they, they thought that they could see, but... Quite frankly, they were blind spiritually. And that's the same type of language that Jesus uses here. So he wants them to get ointment. Well, who is the ointment? Jesus himself is the ointment. His blood is the ointment. His life, his resurrection, uh, and all that is, that's, that's the solution. That's all of these things. The, the refinement, the clothes, the ointment, all of these things that are going to make the people right are Jesus. It's Jesus who's going to make the people right. So quit trusting in the things of the world and put your faith in Jesus. He continues on in verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. Now that's a good, a good verse right there, but that's a tough verse, right? What does Jesus say? Why is he writing to this church in Laodicea? It's because he loves them. And he says so. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. Now that's a crazy thing, right? Because... If you tell somebody that they do wrong today, they say, oh, you're nothing but a hater. But, but, to, but to tell somebody they're wrong or to discipline someone when they're, when they're in danger of harm, that's not something that we do out of hate. I mean, sometimes we do it with a judgmental heart that's not right. But, but sometimes we do it with a loving heart. And so to discipline someone who is in the wrong, to rebuke someone who is in the wrong, Jesus says, I do that because I love you. If, if Jesus didn't love us, he'd say, go do what you want to do. I don't care. Live your life. It's your choice. If Jesus didn't love us, that's what he would tell us. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus says, I love you too much to see you on this path to keep living in sin and doing what you want to do. So therefore, stop doing it. Stop doing these things. Now, he lists some things here for the church of Laodicea, but what about us? What are the things in our life that maybe Jesus says, you need to stop doing these things. I'm telling you they're wrong. I'm rebuking you. I'm disciplining you because I love you and I don't want to see you continue on in these things. So what does he do? He says, so be committed and repent. If I'm telling you what's wrong and you know that it's wrong and you've heard my word, then listen to me and do something about it. Well, what's the only thing we can do about it? We can repent and say, God, I am, I'm sinning. I'm a sinner. God, forgive me. I don't want to live this lifestyle and do this anymore. And so Jesus tells them what's going on. He says, you're not doing good. Here's how you can do good. Follow me. Know that I love you. That's why I'm getting on to you. Take what I've told you and repent of your sin. 
Now, this instruction is good for us. It doesn't matter how long ago this word was written. These words are good for us today too. He continues on, verse 20. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and have dinner with him and he with me. The victor, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus gives them the command. He tells them what they need to do. They need to repent. And then what does he say in verse 20? Listen. Listen. Now that's a pretty strong word. I mean, listen doesn't seem like a very impressive word, but it's pretty strong when Jesus says, I'm telling you what you need to do, so listen. And then what does he tell them after that? He says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and have dinner with him and he with me. Jesus says, I'm here. Now, he's, he's speaking to a church. He's speaking to Christians here. Now, maybe some of them weren't genuinely Christians, but perhaps some of the ones he's talking about here, no doubt, were Christians and still doing the same wrong. And Jesus, he comes to him and he's pleading with him and he's rebuking him and disciplining him. And he says, I love you. But he says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. He's knocking. This whole message, this whole passage is Jesus knocking, saying, are you going to listen to me? Are you going to allow me into your church to be the head of your church, to trust me the way you should? Were they going to go to the door? And Jesus was knocking, but were they listening? Were they going to open the door? Were they going to welcome him, him in? They, they have here an opportunity to repent. But what are they going to do? What about you? Maybe today... Maybe today Jesus is just a knocking. Maybe he's been knocking all week or all month or all year. Maybe he's been knocking for the last 50 years. Are you going to open the door? Because maybe today he's knocking. But what if tomorrow the knocks stop? What if you say, I'm, I'm going to go to the door tomorrow, Jesus. I'm going to repent tomorrow, Jesus. I'm going to trust you tomorrow, Jesus. But what if tomorrow never comes? When opportunity knocks, you better answer the door. And Jesus tells the people here, look, you are, you're not doing right. You're not living right. You're not following me. You're trusting in your wealth. But repent of those things and put your faith in me. Jesus says, I'm knocking and if you'll come to the door, if you'll open the door, I'll come in. You can die. We can eat together. We can have fellowship together. That's what Jesus wants is fellowship. A relationship with, with, with God is fellowship for all of eternity with, with God the Father and Jesus the Son. And Jesus says, you open the door, this is what you get. That's what God wanted with Adam and Eve in the garden in creation. He wanted a relationship to fellowship with them, to love them, for them to love him and for him to love them. That's what God desires. He still desires it today. And it's still a possibility because Jesus Christ gave his life on a cross and his blood was shed so that our sins could be covered. And by the power of God, he was raised from the grave three days later so that we could have victory over sin and over death. And Jesus comes to him here and he says, I can give you the victory over these sins in your life. I love you. I see what you're doing is wrong. Don't do it anymore. I'm knocking. Would you please just open the door and let me in? And so it is for us today. I believe that Jesus still is knocking on a lot of doors today. Maybe he's knocking on the doors of some Christians. Saying, are you going to let me back into your life? Are you going to fellowship with me? Be one with me? Or are you just going to keep living in sin? And Jesus says, for the one who wants to do that, he says, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Wow. Jesus uses strong language here because he wants to make a point. He wants to get the message across. He wants people to hear him at the door and he wants people to let him into their life. 
And that's still what Jesus desires for you and me today. Maybe you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ. But maybe today you hear him. Well, if you hear him knocking, I, I pray that you go to the door. Maybe today some of you are his. But you've kind of been shutting Jesus off. Maybe you're angry at him for some reason. Or maybe it's just sin. It's just done got in there and you're kind of pushing Jesus to the back. Maybe Jesus is saying, hey, I'm still here. You're doing this by yourself. You're doing it the wrong way. Let me, let me come in. Let me, let me join you. And I'm telling you what, when we're in good fellowship with the Lord, life is good. But when we are a friend of sin, life is not good. So Jesus knocks. When opportunity knocks, let us go to the door. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you. We thank you for these good words today, and I pray that you help us to see them and understand them. Dear Lord, this is heavy stuff that we look at today, God. It's heavy because, you know, we're like those Laodiceans. We sin sometimes, even, even those of us who are yours, even this body of Christ that we call Enterprise Baptist Church, dear Lord. Perhaps sometimes you could give us a word of encouragement like you do some of the seven churches, but God, maybe other times we need to hear a word of rebuke and discipline like you gave to the Laodicean. So God, help us as a church to be on fire for you, to not be just going through the motions. Sometimes we do it, dear Lord. I pray that you forgive me as a leader for not always doing, doing good to keep, keep us excited and on track, dear Lord. Help me to do better. Help us as a church, dear Lord, followers, to do better, dear Lord, to not get lazy. It's so easy, dear Lord, to get lazy, but help us not to. Help us to stay hot for you, dear Lord. We don't want to be lukewarm. We want to be hot. So I pray, God, that through Jesus we'd be hot today. God, I pray for anyone in this room that does not know Jesus Christ, maybe today they hear that knocking. God, I pray that they go to the door, and when they do, that... God, did that go into the door is repentance. When they go to the door and say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me. I know that you died for my sins. I know that it's only through you my sins can be forgiven. God, if somebody feels that in their heart today and knows your word is true and knows that Jesus is the only Savior, I pray, God, that in this moment that they say, God, I repent. Forgive me of my sins and, God, I follow Jesus Christ and make him my Savior. I put my faith in him. God, if there's one in this room that has said that in their heart today, I pray that in these next few minutes that they come forward and make it known to this, this congregation, God, that we can, we can baptize them just like your word commands. God, maybe there's some of us here today and we are yours, but maybe, just maybe, we're not living right. Maybe there are some things in our life we need to repent of. And so, God, I pray that if we hear you knocking at our heart today, that you'd help us to open the door and say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, come back in. Jesus, I want to have good fellowship with you again, dear Lord. So God, I pray that you bless these words, that you would help us all to grow in you. I pray that you just bless us as we leave this place, dear Lord. That if there's any knocking going on on any hearts today, and that we would not leave without coming to you and pouring our heart out to you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.